myself. Uh, thank you all. Um, thank you, Dean Davies. Uh, really, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank everyone at The Ohio State University, Mr. Lawrence for sponsoring these types of events, talks like this and the competition, and everyone in the program on dispute resolution. Y'all's leadership has been and continues to be invaluable to our field. It is an honor to be with you all, and I am excited to talk with you about this idea of reimagining negotiation for the 21st century. There we go. So in the face of COVID-19, right, we are all forced to start utilizing technology tools such as video conferencing uh, to the extent that uh, most of us maybe hadn't done before. And so today I wanna talk with you about how I see this use of technology growing the opportunities it presents, but also the responsibilities and challenges that come with it. It seems that when the shelter in place orders went into effect, we really focused on how we were gonna transition our in-person interactions into this online environment. So in legal education, we focused on how to redesign our courses. Um, we took trainings about Zoom and course design. We quickly expanded our knowledge and comfort with these tools so that we could continue serving our students. The same was true for mediators and attorneys figuring out how to best use these video conference tools so that they could continue serving their clients. And although I applaud the legal profession, legal education and dispute resolution fields adaptation to video conferencing, I just have to say that there's so much more that's possible. Um, it isn't enough for us just to be talking about video conferencing software in our teaching um, and how we're hearing cases or even negotiating online. Technology is just so much more. So today I wanna to talk with you about three things. One, how we can take this newfound comfort and familiarity and turn it into a tech fluency or the ability to learn and assess te new technology really quickly. Two, I wanna talk about understanding the increasing role that data analytics is playing so that we can recognize the risks and benefits associated with it. And three, I wanna talk about the tool of imagination, using our creativity to think outside the box and really reimagine the con constructs in which we negotiate. And to do this, I'm going to use a metaphor that comes from essayist Aaron Daddy Roy, who published a piece in April this year, sort of right at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, um, called Pandemic as a Portal. And she says that in this moment, we, she's noticing like this longing for a return to normality. And she says this longing for a return to normality really refuses to acknowledge that a rupture occurred that a rupture exists. And she says, in the face of this rupture, we have a choice. And here I actually wanna quote some of her language because it's really um, quite powerful and strong. She says, we have a choice to walk through this portal, one, by dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and dead ideas, or two, we can make the choice to walk through it lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. So often we uh, position ADR as the way for the legal community to walk through such a portal a little lighter. I mean, we're part of the solution. We're the alternative. We empower, we give voice, autonomy. We value self-determination, right? We're not stuck in the walls of prejudice and hatred or dead ideas. We're the new idea, or at least we were. Um, we're the alternative. We're the field that sits as a more empowering and social justice minded approach to dispute resolution. We encourage parties to have a voice to look at their dispute more holistically, to be creative in solving their problems. And yet, we've got our own issues, our own limitations that keep us from fully realizing our potential. There's critiques about the proliferation of private settlement that we should be looking at. We have these ideals of working outside the box, being creative, being problem solvers, not being limited to the narrow legal issues or solutions that are usually presented. But how often 
do we reflect on our own processes and look beyond that what, uh, which we've taken for granted or assumed as our norms and our truths to better understand what it is that we do? So today I wanna walk through sort of a progression of adaptation to technology in our field, adoption of technology that our field and negotiation in particular is using um, to discuss some additional opportunities and challenges that presents. So I'm gonna talk with you about technology and negotiation from three different points of view. So one, technology is a communication conduit. Now, the use of technology to facilitate the communication between negotiators in an online environment. Two, the use of technology to support decision making in negotiation. And three, the use of technology to transcend some of those limiting constructs that impact negotiation so that we can more fully live up to its ideals within dispute resolution. And I'm gonna start with uh, this idea of technology as a communication conduit by telling you a story. Um, this lecture is associated with the Lawrence Negotiation Competition, the intramural competition at OSU that I think is taking place next week. Um, the, uh, the intramural competition um, and the ABA's competition is gonna be taking place all in line for the first time Ever. And so I want to explore the dispute resolution's evolution of comfort with technology as a communication conduit by telling you a quick story about a previous experience I had in a related ABA competition. So the ABA negotiation competition uh, for years, always held in person, teams of two individuals uh, sitting across the table negotiating a deal or dispute being judged on their ability to work across the table, work behind the table with their partnership, and really furthering their clients' interests. Now, we're still awaiting the ABA's guidance on what exactly this is gonna look like in an online environment, but I'm thankful that the ABA recognizes that we can still have this competition. Students can still have the opportunity to participate and I don't take this for granted uh, because about five or six years ago, I had a team compete in a related ABA competition. It wasn't the negotiation competition. When we actually missed our flight on the way to the regional competition. Um, unfortunately, it was the last flight out of Chicago. I will never book the last flight um, anywhere. Um, but it was the last flight out of Chicago. We miss it. It's Actually, it was canceled, so it wasn't really our fault, but it, <laughs> there was no way that we could make it to the regional competition. So I reach out to the organizers, both at the national and regional level, and start talking to them about the situation. And as we're ought to do in the dispute resolution field, right, uh, we tried to problem solve, think creatively to see if there was still a way for my students to compete and participate. I suggested this idea of using video conferencing um, no one had done this yet. It certainly wasn't um, contemplated in the rules. And although no one was sure how it would work, the organizers did agree to allow my students to participate by using video conferencing. However, they said that if my students did well, they wouldn't be allowed to advance. It just wouldn't be fair. Um, see, there wasn't trust in the technology, but also in the people's use of technology. And yet here we are, right? The ABA has moved the negotiation and all of the competitions online. Why? Did we change our trust in this technology or our use in the technology? Not really, it's the pandemic. We were sort of forced um, to move online. This is what negotiation looks like today. Well, in our classes as simulations or in practice. But like the ABA competition, it kind of took a pandemic to make us fully embrace the use of video conference technology as a viable format. It's not like we had this massive adoption um, prior to the pandemic, and I don't think we would have had this massive adoption absent the pandemic, but here we are. Five or six years ago, when my students missed their flight, it wasn't novel to talk about the use of text-based platforms. Uh, video conference software was out there. People were talking about it. We have an entire subset of our field called ODR, um, but it hadn't really been widely adopted. Folks like Colin Rule, Ethan Cash, and I see you, Noam Ebner, uh, were promoting its use, but 
they were still sometimes seen as on the edge, on the fringe, right? Although what they were saying made sense, our field just felt uncomfortable fully adopting technology. And I think we felt uncomfortable because we were unfamiliar with the technology, we were uncomfortable because we were worried that the process would somehow be a, a lesser form uh, for or experience for the parties. Just last week, you know, uh, there was a blog post citing research about this lesser experience. Uh, the title was The Pitfalls of Negotiations Over Email. In conflict resolution, face to face has advantages over screen to screen negotiation. This skepticism. Um, stems from fear and unfamiliarity, the concern that this lesser process would lead our field, or it did lead our field, to ignore the use of text-based and video conferencing as a viable means for conducting these processes that we so love. But then COVID hits, sort of forced to adapt and adopt these technologies that weren't new, but maybe were new to us. We scrambled, we took trainings, for some, there was some reluctance, but we certainly began trying this platform um, and this particular platform called Zoom. And here we are, just a few months later, and it's sort of become the norm. I'm certainly not naive to think we have fully embraced uh, all of this technology. There's still some of that longing to return to normal, as Aaron Daddy Roy says, but I think some are finding that these changes are a good thing. This is a quote from Chief Justice McCormick of Michigan Supreme Court, who says, I don't think things are ever returned to the way they were. And I think that's a good thing, she says. Michigan is one of those states that uh, massively adopted online uh, processes for their courts um, in the face of the pandemic. And this is a quote from a magistrate in Cuyahoga County, Ohio. Uh, she said, ideas that just a month ago were considered radical or out of the question are actually being embraced now and probably going to become part of the norm. So once we were forced to adopt and use these platforms, platforms that I think were once considered sort of out of the question, uh, as stated by Magistrate Ergen, I think people realized it wasn't so scary. Um, people are now a little less afraid. They're certainly more familiar. And the more familiar we get with the technology, the more effectively I think we're gonna be able to use it. Right? Just think about your own use of Zoom a year ago. Maybe you had never used it. Maybe you had used it in a limited manner. Now think about your use of Zoom in March and what that experience was like, how you were learning this new technology and maybe feeling a little overwhelmed, but now look at where you're at today in September, right? Most of you probably know how to switch things between speaker view and gallery view. You know how to mute yourself most of the time, right? Uh, we know how to use the chat function. We have learned to adapt and adopt this technology. And I'm hoping that we can learn how to leverage this new comfort, expand upon it, and turn it into tech fluency. Tech fluency is sort of the ability to learn, adapt to, and assess new technology quickly. It's the comfort of digging in and figuring it out. It's the curiosity to uncover what the technology can do, all the while being empowered to engage it critically, not to dismiss it outright, but to look at it with a critical eye and make sure it's doing what it says it's supposed to do. So I'm just suggesting that we need to leverage this new comfort and familiarity that we've gained to flex a new muscle, a tech fluency muscle, and become comfortable not only with the technology that we now know, but the technology that we don't know, but is certainly coming. So that when we face that new technology, we're gonna be a little more capable and comfortable adapting to it and assessing it. Technology is rapidly advancing, whether it's Moore's law, which says that computer processing power has been doubling every two years, or something called Huang's law that was just uh, announced last week, which says that AI, which isn't just a software, but is all, um, isn't just a hardware, but is also a software, is able to double its processing power every two years. The point is technology innovations growing at a rapidly increasing rate. 
Now, some of the examples I'm going to talk about later in the presentation may demonstrate uh, this rapid change in emerging technology a bit better. But for now, I just want to uh, stay um, in this text-based and video-based communication context and talk about how it's changing and this changing the analysis that negotiators need to um, do when choosing which mode of communication they think is going to best suit them at the time. Let's stick with uh, video communication just uh, for a moment. Um, we used to think of video conferencing as really only a synchronous communication, like today, right? I am presenting to you live. We're not in the same space, but we are interacting at the same time. But more and more, we're using videos in an asynchronous format. We're using short video recordings, whether it be on Snapchat, Instagram, or Marco Polo. And when I say we, maybe the younger generation, I certainly see my daughter doing this all the time when she should be doing her homework, but that's a whole nother story. Um, but we're using these platforms that allow us to record short messages, send them back and forth like we would an email in this asynchronous format where it sits until the other person is ready to watch, listen, or hear the message. This means we can leverage some of the richness of video communication while still benefiting from the asynchronous mode that allows one to pause before recording, sit on something for a while to make sure we've really fully thought it out, um, really make sure we know what we want to say, giving us the potential to be a little more calm and centered in our response rather than reactionary. So video uh, messaging is no longer just synchronous, it can also be asynchronous. But let's look a little bit at texting as well or text-based uh, communication. Platforms like Slack or Microsoft Teams are being used in a professional setting to create an entirely online workspace where we may be working from different places, working from home, but we are working at the same time, right? So now we can have synchronous chats. Um, with these new online workspaces, it also has allowed other things to become possible as well. So whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, these new workspaces have expanded the use of explanatory content in the form of emojis, thumbs up, or heart reactions um, that add some of the social and emotional interaction that was previously lacking in text-based communication. It can still be asynchronous, but with these emojis, reactions, or GIFs, uh, we're able to build in some of the emotion that may not have been possible before. It's also removing our anonymity. We used to talk about the potential benefit of using email or text-based communication when we're in a position of lower status or power. The anonymity of email, sometimes removing that cognitive and implicit bias that might be in play when we're face-to-face, -face, whether that's in person or video. But now, email programs and other text-based communication platforms use profile pictures um, or links to online bios, including our titles, and status that is removing that anonymity. And so as much as we have now adopted these new technologies that for years we were sort of not just skeptical but ignoring, we still have a ways to go. Uh, there's more research to be done when we consider the new types and combinations of communication technologies available to us. Which leads me to the second context in which I think we use technology, and that's as a decision-making support mechanism. Technology as a decision-making support mechanism uses technology to provide additional information to parties to help them make more strategic decisions about settlement. Now, I think we're all familiar with some of the basic concepts in negotiation, right, such as uh, anchoring, aspirational thinking, uh, or principles, objective criteria and bases that we use to back up our offers and demands. Or the Batten analysis, evaluating what our alternatives are to understand whether or not we should accept or reject an offer on the table. Increasingly, technology and data analytics in particular is able to provide more accurate information from which to follow these best practices. So for instance, this is a screenshot from Picture It Settled, a platform that's been around for a while, um, but it utilizes massive amounts of settlement data to help negotiators reach their target number. 
by suggesting distributive moves uh, that are more likely to entice the other side towards your target. It predicts the number of rounds and the amount of each move that's needed to get to your target. It visualizes and predicts essentially the impact of aspirational thinking and anchoring. And here's a screenshot from Bloomberg Law's legal analytics tool that demonstrates how massive amounts of uh, information about cases in the courts and judicial behavior have been collected. This particular screenshot provides some historical information about the percentage of cases by a judge that were affirmed or reversed. Um, this is a screenshot of the same tool being used to identify which court opinions were most cited by this judge in their opinions. And this is a screenshot from Lexis's litigation analytics tool called Lexis Connect that provides historical data about the judge's motion decisions. Right. So, for instance, the top one I think that's highlighted is uh, the percentage of time that the judge granted a motion for summary judgment. These programs are providing attorneys information to enhance their ability or accuracy in their Batten analysis, at least in the context of litigation. So instead of relying on an attorney's maybe limited experience, and when I say limited, even if this is a senior attorney partner who has been practicing for decades, the information that they have is always gonna be less than the extensive data that's available in these litigation analytics tools that have every case ever before this judge. So the data that's available today is just far more extensive and thus the statistical information it's providing is likely more accurate. Picture it settled, platforms like Lexis, Lexis Connect and Bloomberg Law's litigation analytics use these large amounts of data about cases to provide insights but it isn't just about disputes and settlements that data analytics is providing some support in our decision making. We can also use large amounts of data about contracts housed in a business or law firms database um, as a means of providing principles and criteria when negotiating deals. So let's just say you're negotiating this book publishing agreement, you and the attorney are exchanging drafts, um, marking up a contract, really trying to come to some agreed upon language. There's services like Kira and KM standards that provide contract analysis to assist the negotiator to identify principled reasons or objective criteria um, to assert or demand their language be adopted. Negotiators can use this information, one, to go into that database of preview previously agreed to contracts and identify those clauses, the language in those clauses that's most often used, sort of as a standard for their business. They can use this contract analysis then to compare the suggested language against those standards and see where the suggested language differs, all within minutes. You can also use this type of data to analyze which of the clauses tend to be, in previous contracts, tend to be more regularly litigated. Bringing that attention, uh, bringing that information to the attention of the other negotiator in the negotiation about your current agreement to say, I don't think we should use this language. I have data that's demonstrated, right? So using these contract analysis tools to support us not only in our disputes, but our deals as well. Um, this is just a screenshot of how it highlights and draws your attention to certain parts of the agreement uh, where there might be issues according to uh, the comparison between your database and the suggested language. So I've talked about a little bit about how these decision making support tools might be used by a negotiator, but I really want to talk about how this changes the context in which a negotiator practices. In 2018, Ed Walters, who's the CEO and founder of a company called Fastcase, as well as an adjunct professor at Georgetown Law, uh, published this book called Data Driven Law. The book makes the case that as more data becomes available, lawyers are going to have to increasingly use these types of data analytics to demonstrate that they're providing effective and efficient services to their clients. 
The vast majority of the book really focuses on the business of law and the use of data to inform business decisions around the cost of a case. But it also relates to negotiation in the use of the data analytics tools that I was talking about before when he poses this hypothetical ethical question. He says, will it become malpractice if an attorney rejects a negotiated offer that data analytics is saying is 40% higher than settlement offers in similar cases? In other words, if an attorney doesn't use data to inform their client's decision making in a negotiated settlement, and that settlement offer is 40% higher than the average amounts of settlements in cases like it, will that be considered malpractice if she advises her client to reject the offer? The idea being that this data has power in better informing our decisions. Now, although Ed Walter's hypo of the rejected settlement offer might not be considered malpractice today, there is a rule of professional conduct that says um, in order for us to maintain our competency, we not only have to keep aggressive changes in the law and its practice, and now I'm reading the highlighted piece here, we also have to stay abreast of the benefits and risks associated with relevant technology. This was um, drafted in 2012 by the ABA. It has now been adopted by 38 states. Notice Ohio and Illinois uh, are both highlighted. What were some of the other states I heard? Uh, maybe I think I heard Nebraska, Missouri highlighted. Um, anybody who is from California, you may notice that that state's not highlighted, but California has really adopted this through an ethics opinion. So let's make that 39 states. And then there's states like Florida, uh, my undergrad alma mater, that has not only adopted uh, this uh, uh, amended comment, but also requires attorneys to demonstrate competency by taking, uh, I think it's three hours of continuing legal education during each reporting period. So as we move through this life in the midst of a pandemic, trying to figure out how we continue to do things in this online environment, whether that's uh, how courts are going to continue, how law schools are going to continue, or negotiation competitions are going to continue. I think we also need to be talking about what we're teaching, recognizing that these emerging technologies are really rapidly developing in, the, um, in a way that's going to increasingly inform our decisions. Let me just say two other things about that. So one, it's not dictating our decisions. The data that Ed Walters mentions and the hypo that he talks about, it isn't that the lawyer is um, guilty of malpractice because they didn't accept the offer. The lawyer is guilty of malpractice because they didn't look at the data to inform their client's decision. It's still the client's decision. And in dispute resolution, we know there's many reasons why someone might still reject that offer based on other interests besides money. But without using that data, is an attorney competently serving their client when that data at least is available? Two, I'd also be remiss uh, if I didn't talk about the risks associated with these technolo technologies. I'm sort of talking about the benefits, but Rule 1.1, comment eight, says that we need to stay abreast of the benefits and risks associated with this relevant technology. Um, and so I just want to share some work of Princeton's professor, Ruha Benjamin, with you. Um, Ruha Benjamin is a professor of American, African American studies at Princeton, uh, and she last year published this book called A Race After Technology, the subtitle of which is Abolitionist Tools for the New Jim Code. She explores the new ways that emerging technology and innovations are embedded with bias. I should note there's scholars in our own field, like Nancy Welsh, um, who are bringing attention to this um, as well. And concerns I and mean, advocating for more transparency in our use of technology in ODR, online dispute resolution, and online courts. But I think Ruha Benjamin uh, presents sort of a uniquely a unique uh, take on this because she situates these emerging technologies in a social context. She says the understanding that we need to understand these emerging technologies um, in that they are sitting within infrastructures and constructs that are themselves shaped 
by historical prejudices, biases, and inequalities. She says that technology is never going to be free of bias because it doesn't ref only reflect who we are, it reflects the systems in which she lived. And then let me just share a quote with you because I, I loved her language here. She says, there's no supervillain tech bros, um, no evil cabals of trolls launching denial of service strikes from the dark web, no innocent bots corrupted by the inherent evils of Twitter. There's just prejudice and its pernicious adaptability. She calls this discriminatory design. She says it's the human decisions, assumptions, values that shape the process of the technology development that's creating these biases. So as we're learning about new emerging technologies related to data analytics to support our decision-making and negotiation, we've got to situate that information within the structure it sits. This is how we're gonna be able to see both the risks and the benefits. The data analytic tools, again, that I mentioned, don't dictate what should occur, nor make the decision for our clients. It just provides more information with a broader scope of data from which we can help our client make the decision that is best for them. This is the interaction between humans and technology, the unique role that as attorneys we play, right? We're not just providing legal advice. We are a trusted advisor for a client who has a relationship and helps them look at the entirety of the situation to make a decision that best meets their interests. We're counselors at law. We are working with our clients not to feel dictated either by what's going to happen in court or what this data says, but by what makes sense for them. Professor Benjamin goes on to say that by calling attention to this bias and the structures in which this technology is being developed allows us to sort of see the harm that it can create. It provides a language to identify it, not so that we're overwhelmed or discouraged, but she says to be empowered and motivated to give us sort of the intellectual foundation to resist and counteract what is often seen as a powerful force um, in data and artificial intelligence. And so in this last section, um, I wanna talk about um, the role of technology in a way that reimagines those structures in which we're developing the technology. In the last chapter of Benjamin's book, she says that one of the abolitionist tools for the new Jim Code is imagination to reimagine the world outside the existing constructs. This really calls back Aaron Deddy Roy's pandemic as a portal essay that I started with, right? The need to be uh, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. The, ch the choice that we have, and I really wanna be part of the choice to walk through it lightly, ready to imagine another world. Um, and so I wanna talk about what that world might look like. Um, I want to focus on the choice that we currently have, the structure that informs our decisions around the choice to settle a dispute privately or go with a more public form of uh, resolution. I'm currently working on a project uh, that would use a cybersecurity platform that would allow parties the option to choose both a private and a public settlement simultaneously as opposed to a private or public approach to the resolution of their dispute. To sort of understand, first of all, why I think this transforms or transcends the, the construct in which we're negotiating, I wanna just go over a little bit of background um, on uh, this historical choice between private and public settlement. Uh, Early on in sort of the growth of the modern ADR movement, there were a number of critics who voiced concern about the increasing use of private settlements and um, with the increasing use of mediation, um, arbitration, other dispute resolution uh, processes. And their concern was the impact it was gonna have on marginalized communities. So you can look at articles and I'm sure a number of the students are just reading these um, articles by Owen Fisk, Laura Nader, Trina Grio. They point out that these private processes are removing information from the public's purview, prioritizing the individual's desire or need to settle privately over the public's need or right to understand the extent to which certain social harms were taking place or rights were being infringed. Others argued that um, our processes, these ADR processes, were actually forms of social justice in and of themselves. 
this is sort of what I mentioned early on when ADR positions itself as uh, that choice to walk through a portal, if you will, more lightly when compared to the legal system. Um, as, uh, uh, you know, as we say that we, we empower individuals to participate like, in the deliverance of their own outcome, letting them decide what's right for them. We encourage communication and collaboration and that in and of itself is a form of social justice. In the end, I think private settlements sort of won the debate to the extent that it was a, a, a debate at all. But um, in many places, ADR today is the default approach. In some places, it's actually mandatory before even being able to get a trial scheduled. And as ADR proponents, we understand the value of private settlements for individuals. It's quicker. Um, you can have more say in what the outcome is. It's less stressful and emotional oftentimes than going to court. It's certainly more certain. Um, you have a settlement, you know what it's going to look like as opposed to going to court, not knowing if you're going to win. And even if you win, if it's going to be appealed. As I think uh, Dean Davies mentioned in the introduction, ADR has been my one and only career. This is not my second or third career that I came to after practicing. I am a ADR is really my everything. I like to say that it defines me professionally, but also defines me personally. Um, and so when cases came out, um, when Ronan Farrow publishes the article in 2017, demonstrating that this guy, Harvey Weinstein, had been settling cases that alleged sexual harassment, assault, and even rape, and settling them privately and hiding this behavior behind non-disclosure agreements and NDAs, sweeping it under the rug. I mean, I get emotional thinking about it right now, so I apologize. But I just was like, am I on the wrong side of history? If, have I been promoting for my entire career the benefits of private settlement? I'm a mediator by training, so of course, it's always the party's choice, um, but I certainly valued this private settlement. And here's this guy abusing this private settlement and using these NDAs to hide this behavior for years. Now, the allegations um, that Ronan Farrow talks about in his original piece in 2017, it's not like they were new. I mean, there were these rumors about Weinstein, but they had kind of been dismissed in the past, right? Either because of Weinstein's power or because there had been this lack of proof. And folks who um, work in this area know that survivors of some sexual harassment, um, assault, and rape often uh, struggle or do not feel comfortable bringing this to the public's attention out of fear of being disbelieved or being told they can't prove it. Um, they can't prove there was a lack of consent in these acts. But in light of Pharaoh's article, more and more women come out. They uh, start to say that they too had these experiences, right? They were sort of emboldened and it renews, it sparks a renewal in the hashtag MeToo movement. With this renewed attention, it also places uh, a spotlight on this private versus public debate. And in reaction to the realization that people like Weinstein had been um, hiding this behavior behind sort of the abuse, uh, abuse uh, use of NDAs, there were some states and agencies that have passed rules or enacted policies to say, you know what, like in instances of sexual assault, um, harassment, we are not going to even allow this, uh, the use of NDAs in settlement. The parties are going to have to use a public uh, forum. We need to know about these because the harm is just too great. The harm is too great for potential future victims of this behavior, and the harm is too great to the public who doesn't know the extent to which this stuff is happening. Wow, isn't this the debate that was going on in the early days of the development of the modern ADR movement? So, okay, this is a positive. We're trying to protect people, um, but now we have this unintentional consequence that all those benefits we talked about regarding private settlement, um, that there's more certainty, that it's cheaper, um, that um, it's less stressful and emotional. Now that's just been removed from the victim's ability uh, to use private settlement um, or to want private settlement. They have to go public. So there were a few 
fo a number of folks who realized sort of the unintentional cruel irony of these rules and policies that were adopted. Ian Ayers uh, wrote an article about an idea to shift this from um, a public, uh, sorry, a private or public choice, um, then the uh, uh, shift to uh, no private, just public, to something that he identified as an information escrow that allows parties to settle privately. Um, but if or uh, when there is a future allegation against the same individual, then that settlement can become public. So now it's a private, then public system. Um, he calls this an information escrow, the idea being that parties settle privately, they put this information into a database, and when or if there's a match, then information about that settlement becomes public. This is actually being used in the sexual assault um, context on college campuses using a software called Callisto. Callisto allows individuals to report uh, sexual assault um, instances. That report is locked away, maintained anonymous, unless and until there's a second report on the same college campus against the same individual, at which point the original accuser, the second accuser, and the accused name becomes public and the school launches their investigation. So this is getting us somewhere, right? Uh, public or private, uh, not private, only public, now private, then public. But how can we get to a private and public solution? I really wanted to see if there was a, a, a way that we could allow parties a choice to settle a case privately, while at the same time educating the public about the extent to which these harms were taking place. Uh, to use Professor Benjamin's framework, I kind of wanted to reimagine the structure in which technologies were being used um, and the structure in which settlements were taking place. The analogy I kept coming back to was public health. Uh, at the top of your screen is a heat map of COVID cases. Public health has individual health records that are private, but in their aggregate, we're able to describe to the public the extent to which certain cases are taking place. Um, the bottom left is a heat map that uses the same type of idea for police killings. Um, this is um, bringing together uh, at least four different databases um, so that we have a more comprehensive understanding to the extent this is happening. And the bottom right is a heat map about sexual harassment. Uh, it, it utilizes an app where individuals submit information and then based on the number of submissions, it creates a geographical map um, identifying the number of allegations in any one area. And so I wanted to see if we could do something similar in private uh, settlement, but I needed to make sure that both parties were involved, right? The bottom right uh, map really only involves the accuser, not the accused and uh, accuser and accused. So how do we allow the parties to have this discourse and dialogue in a negotiation while still collecting this information? And um, I'm just going to end by sharing with you that there is this cybersecurity platform called multi-party computation. I'm not a technologist, um, but I'll try to explain um, how it works and why I think it advances us into this private and public option um, before taking some questions. So I'm working with a computer science professor, right? he's a technologist, not me, um, to see if this new type of platform would allow us to have complete confidentiality while still being able to compute statistical data. Multi-party computation allows um, multiple parties to encrypt data that they own and they maintain control over but that encrypted data goes into a platform, essentially a perfectly trusted third party of confidentiality, sort of like the information escrow that um, Ian Ayers was talking about, but now within a platform that cannot be hacked, the underlying data cannot be disclosed because it is all encrypted, and yet it can be computed. So if private settlements were put into this system, we would still be able to compute certain statistical information about the extent to which sexual harassment is taking place. Um, I have so I'm going to skip um, some of these slides. The idea is I want to see if we can go from private or public, not private, just public, private, then public, to private and public, right? 
a really more pluralistic uh, option for parties in a, a settlement um, where they can have both. So here's what we've talked about. Uh, Want to talk about, you know, we talked about taking newfound comfort and familiarity to turn it into tech fluency, increasing our comfort with technology, even new technology that we don't know, recognizing the risks and benefits of data analytics as negotiators so that we can um, provide the most confident and effective service to our clients, and then using the tool of imagination to reimagine the constructs in which we negotiate. And uh, the example I've given is using a new technology called multi-party computation. I focus on technology, but it's really about innovation. That's what's most important. Technology is just a tool. Noam Ebner, I see you nodding. Thank you. That is, it is about innovation. He's like, I can be seen. Yes, you can be seen. Um, so that we can walk through this portal, imagine a new world and ready to fight for it. I don't know exactly what path we're gonna take, but I just know that we need to be asking some different questions and using a little bit more imagination. I know a number of you probably have to leave at the top of the hour, um, which is where we're at. So I've just put up my email address and Twitter handle in case you wanna ask questions um, there afterwards. Um, and before I turn it back to Bill, I just wanna say thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you all about some of these ideas. Uh, it's really just an honor and a privilege to be here with you all. And I look forward to hearing the questions that you have. Again, thanks so much. Well, thank you, Allison incredibly thought-provoking, engaging, and creative. You don't, wouldn't mind joining me virtually and giving Allison a virtual round of applause. Uh, on or off mute with your uh, hands or digital hands, however you prefer. Uh, really incredible presentation. People are pushing us to be creative and imaginative uh, as uh, that's what our field of dispute resolution is about flexibility, creativity, and the technology is pushing us in that direction. So really, uh, we, we appreciate you, um, you bringing this uh, talk to Moritz this afternoon. Um, so I wanted to remind folks that they are welcome to put questions into the chat function. And I've got a couple of questions, but feel free to ask more. Alternatively, you could raise your hand if you want to ask a question orally. Uh, but I'm going to start with a question uh, that uh, John Landy a little bit ago. Uh, specifically, would the use of big data aggravate inequalities in society and between litigants? For example, what if parties can't afford to use these tech tools? So specifically, he typed this in during the conversation around the model standards uh, of conduct. Uh, so what if parties can't afford these tech tools, Allison? Uh, so, hi, John. Um, always great to get these questions. John was one of my professors in law school and um, just a great mentor. So um, thanks for the question. Yeah, can it aggravate um, these biases? Yes. Um, when we talk about inequalities, about being able to afford these tools, uh, in the upcoming um, book that Sarah Cole and her co-authors or editors, Andrea Schneider and Art Hinshaw are publishing called Discussions in Dispute Resolution. I hope that's right. Yes, okay. Um, I talk about how the mediator could potentially provide access to these tools. So another sort of transcending construct that we, um, that we look at is the facilitated evaluative dichotomy, um, or at least as it's applied as a dichotomy. I know that was not one Riskin's um, intention. But so if a mediator was able to provide access to some of these tools, um, especially for those parties that were seeking mediators that provide case evaluations, might that allow them to maintain their facilitative nature, but still provide access to an evaluation? And an evaluation that's actually, it's not really the case evaluation, right? Like the data analytics is just what is the historical judicial behavior and what does that tell you about your case? So I think access is always an issue to these new technology tools um, and can create disparities and inequities. Um, 
one way for us to think about uh, uh, overcoming those is using our processes, whether it be from the courts and an ODR or an online court um, mechanism that provides that. I think Noam and Elaine have talked about that in their research. Um, or as a mediator, bringing that as a tool. Again, not for me to do the evaluation or me to dictate what the party should do, but just provide access to this information. Thank you, Allison. Uh, another question colleagues in, uh, at Northwestern and Cohen, uh, who should we in the field of dispute resolution be partnering with to move forward on these creative ADR tech hybrid endeavors? Professor Lynn Cohen, uh, also one of my great mentors. Thank you so much for being here, Lynn. Um, who do we need to partner with? Kind of everybody. Uh, we we need to be looking at the field of technology and innovation not as our competitors who are you know in legal education technology and innovation is getting all of the attention it's the new shiny thing whereas adr used to be the new shiny thing we were growing and now we're sort of feeling like we're shrinking and there's a lot of fear we need to be partnering with the tech and innovation folks because let me just tell you all they are talking about the things that we talk about. They're talking about um, problem solving, creativity. They're talking about the use of diversity in groups and teamwork to come up with better ideas. All the stuff that we've been teaching uh, for years. So they're, I think, actually really open to what we have been discussing. I think we need to be just as open to what they're exploring so that we can learn from each other. Um, so interdisciplinary um, uh, is, the approach and maybe the tech and innovation folks might be the folks we should be looking to. Thanks, Allison. Uh, this one from Finland, maybe your first question from Finland from Mari Vinaren. Uh, how large should the pool of cases ideally be to preserve confidentiality and private in the private public? So coming from a small country, the amount of cases is often quite restricted. Uh, and so how might that be a concern? Um, so I'm not a da data scientist, so I don't want to answer this um, inaccurately. Um, so I'm going to, I will share with you, I guess, some information um, that I think informs that decision, which is that I think it needs to be um, across all private settlements, right? So it needs to be a very large pool. Um, when the states and agencies start taking away the rights to settle privately. I think that a platform like this presents, brings back the possibility of having that choice of private or public instead of removing it while still protecting the, um, the public. And so my hope is that because it puts private settlement back on the table that all of the parties involved might be more willing to use something like this, motivated to want to use it because it um, gives them the option now to have a private settlement. Uh, and in doing so, increase that, that pool. Um, but the exact number, that's why I'm working with a computer science professor. Fair enough, uh, very good. Two questions I'm gonna uh, combine. One uh, from Lisa, she writes, for the multi-party computation, how do you account for private settlements that are not adjudicated and then the data is used on an aggregate basis? She writes, is this fair to the perpetrator? So, um that's a super important question and one that people are asking, uh, have been asking, but also in reaction to all these Harvey Weinstein cases. So Professor Deborah Turkheimer, um, a colleague at Northwestern, has been publishing some um, articles creating a taxonomy about the various forms of um, collection of data that survivors are using um, to to share with each other where the harm might be taking place. And I bring that up because in all of those situations, the accused isn't even part of the um, platform. They're, they're not a member of the communication, either because it's a closed um, group online or uh, somehow sort of a private group, or um, because the accused isn't actually named, there are just sort of these um, allegations about things that are, are happening. So, 
they're not involved at all. This would allow both parties to be involved whenever there's an allegation. I think the concern is, um, as Lisa mentioned, there's no adjudication, right? This is, this is the idea that this is all happening either outside the court system entirely um, or um, as a part of a potential litigation. And so what does this data actually tell us? It doesn't tell us that there was harassment. It just tells us that there's, there was an allegation of harassment. But isn't that in and of itself, I think, information that would be informative um, to society? We are in the face of the Harvey Weinstein, but also let's talk about um, police brutality and what is happening in the, in the reckoning um, that our country is having about social injustice and the relationship um, uh, between police and communities. Um, <laughs> we are debating about whether or not these problems exist. Is there really all of this harassment? Is it that widespread? Is there really this police brutality? Is it that widespread? I don't mean to be dismissive. I just mean to say that the fact that we're having those, we're questioning it, says we need data. We need some information. Um, and this, is, this would provide some information um, to inform those conversations. Yes, we do need data on uh, those issues as well. Uh, I want to turn to Sarah Cole, Professor Cole, for the next question. I figured I asked my own question so I could thank you again, Allison, for, for doing this. And it is really a thrill to see how many people um, from our community are here on this call. Um, I guess I'm thinking about what does the data look like? Um, I think about how jury verdicts look. Um, and you can use jury verdicts to, in a mediation to try and help the parties re, re, uh, sort of gauge their own um, settlement offers and, and, and responses accordingly, but they often have very little information associated with them. So maybe it says car accident, soft tissue injury, $5,000. I guess I wonder, given that settlement agreements often are, are pretty um, complicated and don't just turn on the amount of money that's paid, how, what do you think would be in the database? And I guess secondly, you know, the information gap that John mentioned is seemingly relevant too. that what if you have non lawyer mediators who aren't aware of such a database, if we're kind of empowering the mediators to bring this up, is that going to present some issues. Um, so, let me, can you repeat your first question, sorry, because I started going well, into the media thing in my head. I guess I was just thinking about how, what is the, what is the database information going to look like? Is it just going to say, sexual harassment claims settled and the amount, or is it going to have more information from the settlement agreement? You know, what, Thanks, Sarah. what the initial claim might be, all those sorts of things. What's, what's going to be the information so that it doesn't end up being sort of misused? So I think what I can share with you is that today, this multi-party computation platform exists and we know it can do this computation of encrypted data um, in a way that would never disclose the underlying information, just the output that you've asked. So we know it exists and it's possible with simple uh, questions. Um, the example that they give is, uh, that I was gonna talk about in the um, presentation is the Yao's millionaires problem, where two millionaires wanna know which one of them has more wealth, but they don't wanna disclose their wealth to each other right? They just want to know who's got more. So MPC can allow them to input this information in an encrypted way and just spit out which one has more, right? So the computation of which is greater. Can we do this with such nuanced information? That is what Professor Wong is um, trying to build a model to demonstrate. Um, we are trying to look at different settlement agreements to see how much information we need to put in um, to be able to have uh, an accurate computation. Um, now, what questions we ask is really up to us. We can ask whatever question we want. I think it goes back to uh, the earlier question, how much data um, do you need to have in there for that output to be relevant? Um, so this is all very in its early stages that we need to keep exploring. But if states are going to pass rules that say you cannot, uh, we're going to prohibit the use of NDAs entirely, I could imagine we could have a policy that says you may only um, use an NDA and it will only be enforceable if you use a system like this in hopes of getting broad adoption to get as much information as possible. 
Excellent. Uh, I, that, that is my questions that I have. Um, I have one more for you, perhaps to wrap up and close. Uh, to turn back to the Lawrence uh, negotiation competition, because I know we have a couple of students left, and so maybe they can get some uh, uh, experienced advice on how to negotiate in this competition. So sorry, the ABA said to your student team that participated over Zoom. It just wouldn't be fair. I feel like I hear that I hear that sometimes from them, and that's okay. This year we're all on Zoom. So, what advice do you have for our student negotiators who are going to be competing on Zoom at the end of the month? Uh, that uh, those who stayed on for the full hour might um, might get the benefit of hearing. I guess I'll say two things. So one, first of all, again, thank you to Mr. Lawrence for sponsoring not only this talk, but the competition. Um, we know the negotiation competition is an unbelievable experience for students to get individualized feedback, um, whether it be from the judges in the competition or coaches such as you, Bill, um, working with them in getting them ready for the regional competition. Um, this year presents another opportunity this is that tech fluency. So my first piece of advice is get in there and play with Zoom. Figure out all the features so that you feel comfortable and confident, even though this is the environment that we're in. It's gonna serve you well, not just in the competition, but in life, right? Because it's, this is our normal. <laughs> this is what it's gonna look like. This is, we're gonna be adapting and adopting to these technologies more and more. The second piece of advice is really more, um, a request, which is you all the students, stereotypically on average generally, are the younger generation. You're the ones that are using Snapchat and Instagram in ways that I don't understand with these, synchronous, these asynchronous video chats back and forth. Um, you all need to help us figure out how to evolve our field and to remain relevant, to stick with our ideals, which is empowerment of our parties um, without being plagued with being sort of um, so skeptical of technology that we didn't know how to and weren't embracing it fully. So uh, I would say that is our, um, that's my request. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much, Allison. This has been a delight. Uh, I am so thrilled we were able to secure you for this lecture in this context because uh, Noam wrote earlier, I couldn't think of a better person for this year's Lawrence lecture on uh, dispute resolution. So please join me in uh, giving Allison another round of applause and thank you again so much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Thank you, Ohio State University. And thanks to the community for being here. Um, I owe you all everything, so thanks so much. I know I'm going to stop the recording.